Good morning, Genesis. Uh, before we sing together, I thought maybe we could take a moment and picture something we're grateful for, and then we'll breathe a few breaths together. Just something to help fill this song up a little bit. Um, something for us to hold on to. Maybe there was a smile you didn't expect this week, or um, a kindness that you just weren't looking for, um, or just something that surprised you. It gives you some hope in these hard times. Let's take a couple of breaths together. Breathe in. us with joy and says bless here a while God brings our wat water to wash our dirty our dusty feet God prepares a meal to nourish our weary spirits so let us receive the gracious hostility of our God. Let us rest in this holy place there where there's shade and water, food and laughter. Done. Your labor is not in vain Though the ground underneath you is cursed and stained Your planting and reaping are never the same Your labor is not in vain Your labor is not unknown Though the rocks they cry out And the sea it may groan The place of your toil may not seem like a home But your labor is not unknown For I am with I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, for I have called you, called you by name. Your labor is not in vain. The vineyards you plant will bear fruit The fields will sing out and rejoice in the truth For all that is old will at last be made new The vineyards you plant will bear fruit For 
For I am with you I am with you I am with you I am with you For I have called you Called you by name The houses you labored to build Will finally with laughter and joy be filled The serpent that hurts and destroys will be killed And all that is broken be healed For I am with you I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, for I have called you, called you by name. Good morning, beloved Genesis community. Our first reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 9, verse 35, through chapter 10, verse 23. Then Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages. He taught in their meeting places, reported kingdom news, and healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few workers. On your knees and pray for harvest hands. The prayer was no sooner prayed than it was answered. Jesus called 12 of his followers and sent them into the ripe fields. He gave them power to kick out the evil spirits and to tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives. This is the list of the 12 he sent. Simon, they called him Peter, or Rock, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the taxman, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who would later turn on him. Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick, raise the dead, touch the untouchables, kick out the demons. You have been treated generously, so live generously. Don't think you have to put on a fundraising campaign before you begin. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment. And all you need to keep that going is three meals a day. Travel light. When you enter a town or village, don't insist on staying in a luxury inn. Get a modest place with some modest people and be content there until you leave. When you knock on a door, be courteous in your greeting. If they welcome you, be gentle in your conversation. If they don't welcome you, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. You can be sure that on Judgment Day they'll be mighty sorry, but it's no concern of yours now. Stay alert. This is hazardous work I'm assigning to you. You're going to be like sheep running through a wolf pack. 
so don't call attention to yourselves. Be as cunning as a snake, inoffensive as a dove. Don't be naive. Some people will impugn your reputation and your motives. Others will smear your reputation just because you believe in me. Don't be upset when they haul you before the civil authorities. Without knowing it, they've done you and me a favor, given you a platform for preaching the kingdom news. And don't worry about what you'll say or how you'll say it. The right words will be there. The spirit of your father will supply the words. When people realize it is the living God you are presenting and not some idol that makes them feel good, they are going to turn on you, even people in your own family. There is great irony here, proclaiming so much love, experiencing so much hate. But please don't quit. Don't cave in. It is all well worth it in the end. It is not success you are after in such times, but survival. Be survivors. Before you've run out of options, the Son of Man will have arrived. Oh, hello. Oh, hey, how's it going? I'm just uh, doing my laundry. These past two weeks have been so crazy. So it's like my 10th load of laundry in probably two weeks. That's an over exaggeration. I always find I have so many socks. Where do they all come from? I've got long socks, short socks, matching socks, mismatching socks, purple socks, blue socks, black socks, white socks, polka dot, striped. I'm gonna have a sock party. So many socks. Do you have a lot of socks? You know, with all this extra free time and a lot more quiet in the world, I find that my brain has a lot more time to think, to think, to think. So many thoughts. With all this extra thinking comes a lot of wondering. With a lot of wondering comes a lot of questions. So I thought maybe we could make a video series where we just ask questions. And it'll be called Wonder, I wonder, come wonder with me. I wonder, I wonder who came up with that idea. But speaking of socks, I've always wondered, did Jesus wear socks? As we wonder, I have this really awesome book. It's called the world Jesus knew. Let's take a look in a book. Before we talk about what kind of shoes Jesus wore, let's first look at what kind of clothes did Jesus wear. Everyone wore basically the same outfit. It might vary a bit by your status or gender, but nearly everyone wore some version of a simple tunic. Usually made of wool or linen, a tunic was made like a poncho with a hole for the head and usually belted at the waist. Along with the tunic and the belt, they often wore a cloak that went over their shoulders. In Jesus's day, they didn't have roads or sidewalks like we do. Their roads were made of stones and gravel and their sidewalks were made of dirt. So as they walked around, their feet got really dirty. They would often step in mud or animal poop. Yuck. Ancient footwear ranged anywhere from homegrown calluses on bare feet to the intimidating pointy boots worn by Roman soldiers. In addition to protecting your toes and making long walks less painful, what you wore on your feet or didn't showed people your status or how much money you had. Being barefoot meant you were really, really poor. But if you could afford shoes, they were made out of wood, camel hide, and leather. And they could have looked like this, this, or this. Now we know. Jesus probably didn't wear socks. You know, if Jesus did wear socks, would he wear socks and sandals? Hmm. I wonder. Be sure to join me next time when we ask more questions together. And if you have any questions you want to ask me, go ahead and email them to me. Thanks for wondering with me. So many 
Good morning, Genesis. This is Kara, your ministry director, and I'm here with a couple of announcements for you. If you're able to give to the church, you can do so at genesiscovorg slash give. And now you can use our text to give option, which is um, texting any amount to 612-688-5644, and it'll walk you through the steps to do that. Thanks for any way that you are able to help support the work of Genesis and the folks who call this place home. We have a couple of things we're gonna to highlight today. Uh, the first is an event on Tuesday night that Betsy Hines is gonna host. And let me look at my notes so I make sure to get it right. She wants to create um, a virtual online space for folks who are interested in doing a breath practice, to have some simple check-in questions, to give kind of a, a safer space to process and lament. Um, as we kind of move forward in this restorative work um, within our community. So if you would like to be part of that, you can um, message her uh, at elizabeth.ann.hines at gmail.com. You can also check out the Genesis Community Facebook page and find out more information about that. Next, we've got some book discussion groups taking place and well, they're starting to form. So if you are interested in gathering with a couple of other folks at Genesis, um, virtually meeting or meeting as a small group uh, in somebody's yard or what have you, um, on topics about uh, books that cover race and justice, um, we would love to help you connect with somebody else who is also gonna be doing that. Or you can find your own folks to kind of gather together to do that. So if you need help, finding some other people, you can email me at v at genesiscub.org and I would love to help connect you up. For those of you who are um, reading Stand Your Ground, there was a, um, a guided set of questions that Steve had um, prepared for our Genesis Weekly email this week. You can check that out there or on our website and there'll be more discussion questions to come for that. Um, next, we've got our summer survey. Hopefully you got the link to that in your weekly email. If you didn't get a link um, or missed it somehow and you need it, just um, comment here on the Facebook watch party or you can touch base with any staff member or email Hello West and we would love to get that link out to you. That survey is going to cover things about our upcoming summer plans, including online worship and um, potential summer gatherings and um, these book groups, like I mentioned, and anything else you wanna share. So we appreciate any time you can take to um, fill that out for us. You can read the other announcements in your liturgy. And um, really, if you have questions, if you need prayer, if you need care, please don't hesitate to contact us. And all of those um, email addresses are on your liturgy. Let's hear our scripture now this morning. Our second reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 1 through 15, and chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. 
and Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God has commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my home. You know, it's super weird preaching to a computer. So I wanted to put up this stained glass Jesus that I colored. And maybe it can remind us a little bit of Elam. And maybe we can pretend like we're all sitting in the pews together. Um, could be fun. <laughs> but, you know, I love this story today. Now, I'm an Old Testament gal through and through. So any chance I get to preach on the Old Testament, I'm going to do it. Um, but the more that I dug into this story, the more my mind was blown. And we all know this story, right? Or at least we all know that Abraham and Sarah had a son when they were super old and then they laughed about it. And that's why his name is Isaac or Yitzchak, which in Hebrew means he laughs. But as I was looking through the text this week, and there were some prime texts, like the really long one I made Bob read about hospitality and spreading the gospel, or there was the classic Romans text about how suffering produces perseverance, which produces character, hope, and guys, hope does not disappoint. Good text. But then I read this Abrahamic narrative and my soul was awakened. I was initially struck by the tempo of this story. There's suspense and excitement as Abraham rushes and runs, creating an atmosphere of hurry. And all this crescendos into this moment in which time itself seems to be suspended. The tempo slows and allows the drama and weightiness of this laughable promise to hang in the air. The comedic chaos of hastily slaughtering a calf and preparing cakes, very similar to the cakes of Passover, gives way to a new rhythm of humor. A chuckle of disbelief. And I can only imagine that gut-sinking feeling Sarah must have had when Yahweh said, Why did Sarah laugh? But I thought I was alone! I didn't think you could hear me! So here's our first all play question. Close your eyes and pretend that you are Sarah. Pretend that God just gave you a seemingly unrealistic promise. A promise to fill you with joy and hope and to give you the thing you've been waiting your whole life for. <laughs> yeah, right! You laugh in disbelief. And God turns to you, looks you in the eyes, and says, Is anything too wonderful for me? Is anything too extraordinary, too beyond my power to do? How do you picture God in this moment? What tone of voice, what mannerisms, what, what facial expressions does he use? Is he near to you or is he far away? 
Take a moment and share your answers. As I first read through this passage, I pictured God kind of as irritated or mad at me for not believing he could do this. Like I see God as this disappointed parent saying, do you think I can't provide for you? You think I can't take care of you? Yet the more I wrestled with this image, the more I see the tenderness and compassion of God in this moment. I see the heartbroken parent that scooches close to their kid and says, why do you laugh? Do you really think that's not who I am? Do you really think I don't want joy and new life for you? Our story this morning spans a couple chapters, right? It starts in Genesis 18 and concludes in Genesis 21. So I wanted to read all that happened in between and after this will he, won't he, Isaac is finally born narrative. And good news, guess what? It's the easily digestible and theologically conflict-free stories of Sodom and Gomorrah and Hagar and Ishmael. Woohoo! <laughs> but what stood out to me about these stories, and even the story of Abraham himself, is that God hears the cries of her people and then does something about it. After the birth of Isaac, Sarah and Abraham kicked Hagar and Ishmael, an African woman and her son, out of their camp. And as they neared the brink of death in the wilderness, Hagar wept, unbear unable to bear the sight of her dying son. And Ishmael cried out, hungry, scared, wanting his mama. And what did God do? He heard their cries and came near. He said, Hagar, what troubles you? Don't be afraid, for I have heard your cries. And as she opened her eyes, a well appeared in the middle of the wilderness, and she fed her baby. And as Ishmael grew up, God was with him. You see, the way people understood the world back then was that the God lives, lived in the heavens far, far away, and the only way to catch their attention was through crying out really loudly or offering sacrifices with pleasing aromas. So it's like in the story of Mount Carmel, the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and the prophets cried out loudly for Baal all day long, and there was no reply. So Elijah mocks them and says, Ha ha, cry aloud. Surely he's God. Maybe he's meditating. Maybe he's on a journey. Or maybe he's asleep and needs to be woken up. Or maybe, as the Hebrew insinuates, he's relieving himself on the toilet. Or... Like in Psalm 116, the psalm text for this week, told you they were prime. It says, I love Yahweh because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. This theme of crying out and God listening is found all throughout the Bible. And it tells us that God does not leave us out in the wilderness to die. Instead, God steps into the chaos 
and responds with compassion and justice. Now in Genesis 18, it tells the story of these three men who come to Abram's tent. Sometimes they're described as men, sometimes they're described as Yahweh. And I know it can be really, to, really tempting to try to harmonize these differences or maybe read the Trinity into it, but I invite you to sit with the dissonance and let the playfulness of it all be. Because if we try to do otherwise, it draws away from the importance of the divine discourse between Yahweh, Abraham, and Sarah. Because immediately following Sarah's laughter, the three men slash Yahweh bring Abraham with them to Sodom because God has heard the outcries of injustice rising from there. And because God listens and responds to our cries, he's got to check out what's going on. So as they're walking, Yahweh says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And we all know what's about to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? But he says, no, for I've chosen him that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of Yahweh by doing righteousness and justice. Ooh, the ultimate Christian buzzwords, righteousness and justice. But I love it because these two words carry so much depth. In Hebrew, the words are tzedakah, righteousness, and mishpat, justice. And they are so closely related that the Greek language actually combines them into one word, dikaiosune. But to do so, I think, loses the unique connotations that these words carry. Now, every theologian and Hebrew scholar present their own nuances on these words. But I found that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs describes it in a profoundly beautiful way. He says that mishpat, or justice, is the rule of the law through which disputes are settled by right rather than might. And it distinguishes between innocent and guilty. But here's the kicker. Mishpat, or justice, alone cannot create a good society. For what happens when a set of laws is put in place that contains so much inequality that wealth is concentrated into the hands of a few and the many are left without the most basic necessities? Or what happens when a set of laws is put in place that allows the so-called keepers of the peace to do whatever they want with qualified immunity while entire communities are beaten, wrongly accused, and killed by said keepers of the peace. Justice alone is not enough because justice can easily be perverted by the rulers. And that is why we need Tzedakah. Tzedakah, or righteousness, refers to how this law is applied. And it's kind of fun because it brings together two opposites, justice and charity. So let's say you owe a person $100 and you give it to them. That's fair, right? That's justice. But let's say you don't owe a person $100 and you give it to them anyways. That's charity. And the convergence of justice and charity is tzedakah. It is both simultaneously giving someone something that they are owed while also not owed. And so this idea of righteousness, this way of being, is fundamental to the kind of society that God wanted Israel to build. And these two ideas together, justice and righteousness, is the way of Yahweh the way that God wanted Abraham and his descendants to keep. So what have we learned so far? One, God hears the cries of the people. Two, God steps in and does something about it. And three, God does not want to shield us from or for us to be ignorant to the realities and injustices of the world. Instead, God wants us to keep the way of Yahweh by interjecting righteousness and justice into the world. And so we've covered these themes of crying out and listening, of righteousness and justice, and now I want to transition into the theme of promise and faith. 
because this really is central to the Abrahamic narrative. So God's initial promise given to an aged Abram and a barren Sarai is to make them a great nation through which the entire world will be blessed. And God reminded them of this promise at least nine, well, kind of depends on how you count, nine different times throughout the 25 years between Genesis 12 and Genesis 21. And I would argue that their story of faithfulness culminates not with the labor and delivery of Isaac, because those seven verses recounting this moment is just kind of randomly thrown in between the stories of Abimelech and Hagar. Instead, I would argue that their story of faithfulness culminates with the story of holy laughter and disbelief. Perhaps after 25 years of waiting and waiting for this child to come, Abraham and Sarah became accustomed to barrenness. And perhaps after Sarah entered into menopause, they accepted hopelessness as their normal. They have become, as Walter Brueggemann describes, models not of faith, but of disbelief. And I get it. I'm right there with them. I look around at the world right now, and I feel very hopeless. There are systems and plagues and ideologies that are ravaging our world, and I've allowed cynicism to take over my narrative. I have, like Abraham and Sarah, become accustomed to the barrenness of the world. And I have, like these models of disbelief, accepted hopelessness as our normal. Nothing's going to change. It's going to be four more years. The world will burn and dry up. Yet the story of Abraham sets itself against every worldview that regards the world as settled or fixed and against every ideology that presumes there is no genuine newness, no gift yet to be given, and no way a barren womb can produce life. Brueggemann notes this about the nature of promise and faith in the story of Abraham. Promise is God's mode of presence in these narratives. The promise is God's power and will to create a new future sharply discontinuous with the past and the present. The promise is God's resolve to form a new community wrought only by miracle and relying only on God's faithfulness. Faith as response is the capacity to embrace that announced future with such passion that the present can be relinquished for the sake of that future. This, my friends, is the difficult and scandalous nature of faith. Faith is not an easy act or a convenient posture that neatly fits within our rhythms and worldview. It is the acceptance of a radical promise for disruption and discontinuity that will shatter our perceptions of reality. It is the announcement of God's impossibly possible promise to deliver the barren world from the oppression, injustice, and hopelessness and deliver us into God's kingdom of freedom, life, justice, hope, and love. It is surrendering our own ideas about what is possible, about what is real, into the hands of a compassionate, liberating, and creative God. Perhaps the very question God asked of Sarah is the same question God asks us today. Is anything too wonderful, too extraordinary for God to do? Do we think this shift, this redemption of the world is too beyond God's ability? Do we think God does not care for our world, her creation, that she won't do anything about it? When God asks this question, God waits for an answer. And how we answer determines everything else. Will we reject the hope of new life and resign to this idea of a closed and barren world? Or will we in faith accept the possibility that God's compassion, 
justice, and ability is far greater than our perceived reality. Sarah laughs again when Isaac is born. Only this time, it's an Easter laugh. A laugh of resurrection and new life. God was faithful to his promise, for what was barren is no more. And Sarah cries out, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And what I love about this is that in community, laughter is contagious. In community, hope is contagious. And in community, new life is contagious. I can only imagine that as Isaac grew up and lived his own life, he would introduce himself to people and say, hey guys, my name's Isaac. And because names are super important in the Bible, they'd be like, oh cool, he laughs. Why'd your parents name you that? And then Isaac could tell everyone about the unbelievable story of life coming from a barren womb by the power in compassion of this God named Yahweh. Earlier this week, I posted a midweek all play question because I really wanted to hear the voice of the chorus on this one. In the story of Abraham, we see that God is faithful to keep his promises, even the ones that are laughable or seem impossible. And since then, God has given his people many more promises. So I asked you all, what promises of God have you been clinging to in this season? And you said, God is always with me, whether I feel him in that moment or not. Whether I ask for him in that moment or not, he is always with me. God is good. My peace I give to you. This feels bigger and deeper than just an, an external sensation. I am always with you, and everything I have is yours. Not a promise of God, but I believe MLK said, The arc of the moral universe is long, and it bends towards justice. I'm counting on it these days. Yes. God has given us so many promises written down in Scripture, and... He continues to give us promises today through prophets like Martin Luther King. So good. The proclamation of the gospel is that what the world has thought impossible is possible by the power of God. So I want to ask this all play question again with this in mind. The world is not fixed or settled. Our reality is not closed off or barren to new life. It is in the hands of a God who disrupts, who resurrects, and walks in the way of justice and righteousness. And if nothing is too wonderful, too impossible for God, what promises of God have you been clinging to in this season? Or if you're not there, what promises of God are you laughing at in this season? Let's take a moment and reflect and share together in the comments.
Friends, before we enter into 60 seconds of silence and before we take Eucharist together, let us read the prayers of confession. I'll read the leader and then we'll read the all together. For our foolish and careless use of the gifts of your creation, Lord, have mercy. For our indifference to the needs of others, our brothers and sisters for whom you died, Christ, have mercy. For our neglect of relationships and the means of grace, Lord, have mercy. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now we enter into 60 seconds of silence. Come Holy Spirit, speak to us now. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Gracious God, because you are love, you made us out of that love for yourself. When we had chosen sin and fear instead of trust and love in your mercy, you sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature to live and die as one of us, and to provide a way for us to remain in love and trust once again. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took the bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Friends, this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love God and for those who want to love God more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come, because it is the Lord who invites you. It is God's will that those who want God should meet God here.
for such a special morning. As we go from here, I want to send you out with a benediction. So if you would, please hold out your hands open wide and receive these words. Beloved community, as we are sent out into the world of chaos, may we hold in one hand lament and in the other laughter. May we weep with those around us and cry out against systems of injustice. And may we also remember that God invites us and meets us in our laughter. Go in peace. <laughs>